Hello. We're back. This is April. And Hello. Uh, April and I are going to do like a uh, yeah, fireside barstool, barstool chat here uh, and try not to like, sw uh, I will try not to swing back and forth. I think the fly has left me alone. The first five minutes I thought I was going crazy uh, during Carrie's talk. And I was like, there was a fly buzzing around my head. But here we are. Um, so a couple weeks ago, a two, three weeks ago, um, I, I was on Twitter, as I, as I am, and April had sparked some conversation, and we had some good talk, like all Twitter conversations that then like fractured into like 40 different <laughs> sub-conversations, and uh, I was like, hey, let's get together and like talk about some of these things in person, and April was able to join us today. Uh, can you give like quick background on like who you are, what you do, what you know about? Sure, yeah. So I will say, just to be clear from the start, I'm not in HR and I'm not a recruiter. I am an engineer and I have been for the past 10 years professionally and 15 years total. And um, I've been an engineering manager and whatnot, worked at all kinds of startups up in uh, Silicon Valley, recently relocated to San Diego. But um, I now am mostly doing Ruby on Rails type um, development, but I've done all kinds really. I'm more of a generalist. And uh, most recently I started Compassionate Coding, which is my company. And my goal is to bring emotional intelligence to the software development community across the board. So this includes hiring practices, but also just how we communicate on teams. And really starting to value the human element of software development uh, in the way that it should be valued. I would guess that pretty often when you like start a conversation with a team, you walk into an office and then people are like, oh, here's the lady that's gonna like tell us to be nice to each other. Is that pretty much how it goes? Uh, no, because uh, usually I do like the background ahead of time, so I get buy-in from leadership, and uh, we talk about how important this stuff is. Uh, and I will say a misconception is that compassion is just the same as being nice. And uh, I actually don't even, I'm not sure I would consider myself a nice person. Uh, I'm not always very polite. I've been called abrasive, but I still consider myself compassionate. Why? Because compassion for me really is an optimization problem. The goal is to minimize suffering. So compassion means being able to recognize suffering in others and des actively desiring to minimize that suffering. So for me, it's a very logical, a logical thing. Sarah and I were chatting earlier and I was saying to her like I've, I've been starting to wonder if like software is actually very easy in, in, in the idea that like we have software and the, and the people that build the software are like inextricably linked but the software part might be easy it's just that like people are really complicated uh, is that was that like your experience when you're you know doing full-time dev like how do you go from uh, being a kind of like individual contributor writing code to now like working with teams and so forth. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's spot on. I think a lot of the problems that I would see on teams would be people problems, uh, communication issues. Like, we want to introduce a new tool, but so-and-so won't get on board, right? That's a human problem. You may be talking about technology, but convincing somebody to adopt a new tool, that's totally a human problem. Uh, there, I was reading this study from the Application Developer Alliance on why software projects fail, and the top reason was changing or poorly documented requirements, and not, you know, and then like 17% said uh, immature dev tools, and yet a lot of our engineering energy is focused on, let's, you know, build a new JavaScript framework or whatever. It's like that's not necessarily where the failure is happening. It's more about communicating both among engineers and with the product people, with the design people, with the customer. An old friend uh, in the industry who was like a consulting team lead and, and organizational lead would always say, uh, I've never seen a project fail for technical reasons. You know, and, and I think when you look at um, the hoarding analogy that Sarah was painfully bringing us through, and like whatever, just, I don't know, I imagine some of you were like me, just looking at those photos, I was like full of anxiety. Uh, and it's not because of the shape of the house that it like ends up in, in that situation, right? Do, when I worry sometimes with like people teams and people problems, software problems are generally easy to fix. Like you can measure them, you can set like a goal, you can do some work and then you can prove that you met the goal or you didn't. When somebody reaches out to you, it's unlikely uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of like therapy, like we should do it when we're slightly off track, 
but it's probably like, oh, we have people leaving the team and our software is garbage and like help. Is that is it usually like on everything's on fire and you're coming in uh, to like <laughs> temper it? Yeah, it kind of is, which is why I don't always openly talk about the companies I work with because sometimes they're in a state where it's a little bit embarrassing. Like they didn't, they wouldn't want to you know, admit that publicly. That's not always the case. Sometimes it is just, you know, an isolated incident and they want help, you know, kind of dealing with it. Uh, but the therapy comparison is actually pretty valid because that's sometimes that's, it feels like what I'm doing is kind of group therapy, um, except without a license, so I would never call it that. <laughs> so, but, um, but, you know, just helping people talk and, and communicate and uh, just really build empathy because that's, you're, you're right, it's hard to have a metric where what's the empathy level on this team, right? But you can look for certain, um, uh, signifiers of it, like retention rate is one. Uh, how many times does somebody have a blow up on Slack or something? Uh, how many times, you know, will somebody just um, throw a tantrum, which happens a surprising am amount among adult software engineers, uh, more so than in the kids I teach to code, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so like you can look for these things to see like, okay, if we, we do this, and I also incorporate surveys, so, and that's again, not a perfect measurement, but it's better than nothing, where you measure attitudes about, do people feel psychologically safe at work? Uh, do they feel comfortable sharing their ideas? Do they feel supported? And before and after, and kind of see how that evolves over time. I thought it was funny yesterday, you mentioned like a lot of engagements beginning with a Slack log of like, that's check true. out this shit. It's true, those will be screenshots and I'll be just like, oh my gosh. But, but it's also funny because they think it's like the worst, they think that they're the worst, but they're never the worst. There's always somebody that, you know, a team that's in like a worse position and it's so common and it's like, it's not, it doesn't mean that your, your whole company is broken or your whole team is broken. It, it just means, you know, it's like, you know, the agile retrospective, we're all doing the best we can given the circumstances. And I truly believe that in life in general, we're doing the best we can given the circumstances. And when you hire people, uh, you know, speaking of hiring, when you hire people without kind of giving much weight to their ability to communicate, to their ability to disagree in a productive way, that's what leads to these problems. And it's okay because we can help them grow those skills, but you have to recognize that your hiring practices have led you to this team that can't get along. I think there's nothing um, that builds your confidence more as a developer and perhaps as a person than to go visit other companies. And uh, when I used to do technical training, I would go into companies and, and I had mostly worked by myself and like didn't consider myself super expert software developer and then went in and was like, wow, you all really don't know what you're doing, now I feel really good about myself. Uh, it, do, you, do you like see that phenomenon when you walk in the door? Is it uh, like, does the typical team like look functional and need some tune up or is it like we need to tear it down and like start over? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's kind of like with code, you know, it's rarely, the rarely the solution is tear it down. You know, you don't really necessarily want to clean house completely or something. Uh, but incremental improvement, I think, is important. But I think, too, it's, um, it's more like people, when I come in, they, they feel very self-conscious about these things. Like, yeah, like before they show me the log, it'll be like, yeah, you know, just to warn you, this is a little bit, you know, and I'm just like, oh, I've seen it. I've seen it all before. Like, you, you know, so I try to be reassuring because um, it really does happen to everyone. And, you know, and I mean that not just team-wise, but like human-wise. Like, as much as I've tried to learn self-awareness and self-management of my emotions as part of emotional intelligence, I'll still have moments where I flip out and just, you know, lose, lose, lose it. So uh, I think it's something where growth mindset, you know, like the Agile retrospective, get better over time, that's the goal. How often do you have the conversation where it's like, my team is awesome and really cool, Except this one dude, he's a real asshole. And pretty much everything would be cool and rainbows and we'd be cranking releases, except for that guy. So the funny thing about that is I always get along best with the assholes on the team because they're usually the ones who have like the most potential to grow. Because a lot of times, if you really break down why somebody behaves like in this destructive way on a team, it's that they're really passionate about something. Something really matters to them. Uh, probably a lot of things. Like maybe they really care about you know, certain elements of code quality and it's so important to them to the exclusion of the emotions of the people on their team. So they would happily have a tantrum, blow up at you because you violate this value that is so important to them. So what I try to do is help them unpack that. Like why is this person such a problem on the team? 
And usually, it's just because they're really passionate. So once you get them to understand that, they're better able to communicate in an empathetic way and say, here's what I care about, you know, this is why I'm so upset. And then the other person's like, oh, that's why this always triggers that person. And you understand these emotional triggers, and it really, you know, really helps with communication. That said, if you have somebody who's like openly racist or sexist on the team, <laughs> that kind of asshole, there's very little you can do to fix that if it's like extreme, and then you should just get rid of them, of course. Bounce. Um, how do, other than the last uh, case, how do I know if I am that person? <laughs> the fact that you're asking is a good sign. So, you know, because it's... Uh, I'm asking on their behalf. No, no, Because there's a little bit of nervousness, like, wait, I thought my team kind of are a little bit jerks. Maybe, Maybe it's, it's me. me. <laughs> yeah, well, and I would say we all have a little bit in us. We all have a little bit of jerk in us. You know, like I said, I get the feedback that I'm abrasive, which one, women get more than men, but at the same time, I am kind of abrasive, and so it's a little bit valid. Um, and sometimes that comes across as being a jerk. Like, you know, I would sometimes, I used to be terrible at code reviews because I would just be really, really harsh, really judgmental, really mean. Uh, really, you know, go for the go for the ego there and insult people, um, and that's not. What, wait, slow down. Hold on. What, what, is, what does it look like to be like really mean in a code review? Is it like this code is bad and you're also a bad person? So that's the implication. Like, yeah, like yeah. like how could you do this? And I think it's just yeah. like an absence of understanding, like not giving the benefit of the doubt, kind of like being really condescending. That was kind of like my go-to way of of being uh, before <laughs> I got into this uh, compassion and emotional intelligence. Uh, so you're like a recovered bad person. Yes, that is why, and like people don't get that. They're like, oh, you must just be a really nice person. No, talk to my previous coworkers from early in my career. Uh, they would not agree, some of them. These would be great <laughs> testimonials for the website where it's like, let me tell you, April knows about being the jerk on the team. It's yeah. true, and that's why I have hope though, because if I can change, like anybody can. What are, um, like when, when you go into a situation and you're kind of like just trying to get the lay of the land, what are the first things you're looking for to figure out, like, does this team have hope or is it hopeless? Like, what are the signs of things that are working right and going wrong? Well, I never think anyone's hopeless. Uh, I think there's always hope to be you had. You did say the racists, they need to go. And no, I think we can all agree on that. They need to go from the team. They need to be removed from the team. But as human beings, I think they can be rehabilitated. Um, but that's, that's, that's true. But yeah, as a team, I think uh, what I look for, I really just try to understand like what the problems are. Because even when it's pitched to me as a technical problem, I can look beneath that and see why it's really a people problem. Um, like, you know, people are complaining about our video conferencing software. And it's like, well, that's because so-and-so is like really attached to this one video conferencing software for some reason. This is a real example. And so they feel it as a personal threat that someone's trying to get everyone to use Zoom instead. And it's like, you know, it's clearly more of a communication and like emotional issue. And um, so I, I look for the problems on the team, and then kind of diagnose those, like a little, go a little deeper, and like where are the people, where's the people problem there, and then kind of get an understanding of how communication happens. And it's always a bad sign when it's one of the teams where you know people do just go off and code on their own for like days at a time, and like don't talk to anybody on the team. Like that's that makes it a little bit trickier. Uh, but I've done work too on remote teams, and uh, usually it's best when. They come together like once a year for an all hands or something like that, and then I can come when they're, everyone's on site together. Uh, because the, you know, face to face interaction is so important. That's something that we cover in the workshops and emotional intelligence. Is like part of the reason blow ups happen on Slack and on Twitter, uh, and you know, uh, in email and in code reviews for sure, is that. Uh, a lot of communication happens via tone and body language, and you get none of that when you're dealing with text communication. So if it's, I always tell people, if it's starting to get a little bit emotional, either make it face-to-face, -face, make a phone call, like do something human, because you're just gonna get yourself deeper and deeper into this hole of just like aggression and hostility uh, through text. I'm not familiar with that. Um, <laughs> the, of course not. I, the way it was phrased to me once was to think about like the bandwidth of a conversation and that the m more important or the more valuable the topic, the wider you need the bandwidth, right? And it's like, if it's not that important, then like a text is okay or a quick Slack message or whatever. And then like, if it's slightly more important, getting into an email and if it's slightly more important, like a video chat. And if it's like really fucking critical, like get on an airplane and go like talk with the person and, and get that like full bandwidth interaction. 
Yeah, the interesting thing there is sometimes what seems like a small issue has underneath it, like, you know, if you're just debating, like, a video conferencing tool, which one should we use? But, like, beneath it is, like, all this cultural issues and, like, you know, politics and all this stuff. going. So sometimes it's hard to tell, like, w w that it's actually important. Uh, and then you, you quickly find that out. And then it's like, okay, now we need to switch to the next bandwidth thing, I guess, because um, it's actually more important. So then as you try and, and make like incremental improvements to the team you have, and then teams are always changing, right? I think all of us uh, have the experience of, of, of being in software teams and it's not impossible, but pretty rare that you have the same group of folks together for multiple years, much less like three, four, five years kind of thing. As a team says like, hey, we know we have some challenges, maybe we wanna like revise how we're doing hiring. What are, what are you seeing like the best teams do in hiring, and what are the mistakes that people are subconsciously making or not paying attention to and like shooting themselves in the foot? Yeah, so I think the best teams have uh, some kind of rubric in place. It's not like... What's a rubric? What's a rubric? Uh, so a rubric is uh, kind of like um, a form. You can picture like a form with different fields in it. I don't know why I'm describing implementation, but this is what it looks like to me. And you like rate people in certain categories. So you have a st it's a standardized way of measuring performance. And what if we have a rubric that's like? Mm -mm, yeah, mm. no, that's. That, I don't know if that qu that counts as a rubric. It's, uh, that's not a rubric. <laughs> uh, that's shitty. But it's, yeah. Yeah. No, but but a lot of teams do do that. Um, but it, the key is that you're striving for it to be objective, but knowing that it's never going to be objective, uh, because, and here's something that, you know, everyone just needs to make peace with. We are all biased. I'm biased. You're biased. We're all biased. I have a bias for people who talk fast, because I talk fast. I know that. And so I actively, you know. In favor of, or you don't want to do battle with them? Uh, no, I, I like it. I talk fast. And okay. so if I, if I meet someone who talks fast, I think, oh, I'm going to need more coffee. I got, sorry. No, 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 no. You're good. You're good. Um, so, you know, we all have these biases, like we, psychologically, we like people who are like us. This is just true. This is why Kara Swisher points out that tech is not a meritocracy right now, but more of a meritocracy, if you will. Same. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because people, you know, that's why, you know, a lot of rooms like this are filled with people who look very similar to each other. Uh, and part of that comes down to not recognizing our own biases because we don't want to admit that we're biased because we think that makes us a bad person. But the thing is, it doesn't. Everyone's biased. You just have to be aware of it. And then these tools like rubric, rubrics and whatnot are to try to counteract the bias, knowing that you'll never get rid of the bias. What kinds of things do people put on a good rubric? Is it like, uh, you know, I, I feel like people's nightmare scenario would be like, oh, we went from just deciding who was cool and not cool to now we have an 86 question form and like I just click yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, th those are pretty bad. But, but yeah, this whole cool or not thing is pretty common. You know, you might have heard of like, uh, would I have a beer with this person, right? Which sounds like, yeah, that seems reasonable. Like, you know, but it's like, Actually, that's terrible because you know you're not you're not hiring somebody to have a beer with them. That that may be part of what happens, but you're hiring somebody who will balance out the team and you know create productive software and you know create software productively and that kind of thing. Uh, so, but again, yeah, you don't want to make it so. Engineers already hate doing interviews for the most part because um, in general, because even though as Sarah pointed out the people we work with are so important to our happiness. For some reason, you know, we'd rather just deal with the code. So I know like every team I've been on, people complain, oh, I have like two interviews to do today, I have three interviews to do today. And so like that's something that needs to change. We have to like recognize how important it is when we are changing our teams. Um, but I think, you know, uh, Medium uh, has a blog post about this. Their engineering team, the, what they Did do. Did you just say Medium has a blog post? Medium has a Medium post? They do, believe it or not, uh, yeah. at least one. And it's about like their hiring process. And it's, you know, I don't agree with everything in it, but that's just because I rarely agree with everything in anything. But they do talk about really good stuff, like looking for introspection, somebody's ability to, like, analyze their own thoughts, looking for empathy. And they, what I like about it is they give clear examples for people doing the interviews to look for of what indicates empathy, you know, to, when they talk about their past coworkers or the way that they try to understand the interviewer. And they, look, they show like clear signals of what you can look for. And I think that that's really great because 
engineers haven't been trained like with psychology background for the most part, and yet we're having them do this very complex social task of building teams to work together, which is you know non-trivial. And so that's why it's so bad. Like I'm of the opinion that tech hiring is fundamentally broken, and so that's why you know I'm always happy to talk about it because I think a lot needs to change, and a lot of it is valuing these communication skills that um, are right now pretty neglected. A friend of mine uh, who, who's CTO of a company, he shared one of his like zinger interview questions, uh, which is, if I ask people at your old job to tell me something, uh, to tell me about you, what's something they would say that's not true? Mm. And then his hypothesis is that whatever they say it is true, they just haven't accepted it yet. You know, it yeah, is like, no, well I've tried it on a couple people and I'm like, yeah, I think it's, it's plausible. Uh, that's interesting. It's difficult, as you said, like, a lot of interviewers, and I interact with a lot of people who are job hunting, see the other side of a lot of interviews. Uh, it's exceptionally haphazard, and often it's like, oh, I forgot to have this interview in like a minute. Yes. Yes. Hey, you're a person, like tell me about yourself, and they don't know anything, there's no prep, there's no practice, there's no rubric, whatever. Um, it's interesting to think about, I think often for the engineer, the interview feels like a significant inconvenience, right? Like mm -hmm. this is not helping me check off a story for today. But there's probably no more high leverage work that a person can possibly do than to find like a high quality, like a, a, a good augmentation to the team, mm -hmm. right? When you talk with teams, I think there's like, there's hesitation, discomfort around talking about like culture fit. And does that mean that we're creating a meritocracy? Because like culture fit can be used to mean uh, like identicalness, more or less. Uh, how do you like f agitate that conversation? Like push it towards a way because it, it, it culture fit's not irrelevant, right? It's mm -hmm. like uh, there you have to be able to work together and like get along in some ways. But how how do you find like the right middle path in there? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the um one alternative that I've heard is culture add. So instead of looking for culture fit, look for culture add. Look for gaps in your culture and how somebody can come in and augment your culture. And I think that's important, especially for increasing diversity, because we don't need people who all think exactly the same. But that said, you do need some kind of cohesion. You all have to, you know, to a certain extent, share certain things in common. And so the way Medium actually talks about it is a value alignment. So they have you know, a clear set of values, and what they look for is indicators in the interview that the person's values are aligned, or at least that the person you know, can get on board with the company's values. And I've, I think values are so important. I think everybody should take time to really enumer like enumerate their values and allow those to drive their life. And so I think for companies it's similar. Like, don't just have you know the poster on the wall that is just cheesy and nobody you know it's, nobody cares what it says. But really live it every day. Like, really believe that you know the values that you list out for yourself are that important. That that's what you look for in the interview. And again, giving examples of the, how somebody would demonstrate these values in an interview. And a lot of times it is talking about their past work, which I think is you know a great great way to do it. It's interesting talking to both like hiring companies and, and interviewees after interviews and uh, to see how there's often like either misses or like misperceptions on one side or the other. Uh, something that always surprises me is when I, when I talk to an uh, interviewer and if they say about the candidate like, oh, I wasn't convinced they're like passionate about programming or that they like really care about programming. And the way they assess that was like, they asked the question, how do you like programming? And then the person was like, it's cool. <laughs> and then they're like, mm, X. Like you didn't rant for 12 minutes about frameworks and languages and so forth. Uh, how do you work with folks on like improving the, the, the kind of connection between like what you're looking to figure out and what you ask and how you like structure the processes? Yeah, and I think examples really works well with that. So have at least somebody on the team, hopefully in a leadership position, who really understands how important interviewing is, who can help train people uh, in this skill, because it is a skill, and you can learn it, and you can get better. Uh, but in terms of like passion for programming, I mean, I don't know if I'm passionate about programming. I'm passionate about helping people through I software. I kind of hate programming for Yeah, right? I mean, I think it's a useful tool. And it can be fun sometimes. Like, it feels like a game to me sometimes, and I enjoy it. But I don't know if I'd say I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about helping people. I'm passionate about, you know, the art of creation, things like that. So I think 
passion, looking for passion in an interview is fine, but just don't, it doesn't, it shouldn't be about one specific thing. Like, I'm passionate about JavaScript. I mean, like, that's fine, good for you. It's a nice, nice hobby, nice thing to be, you know, good at, but like, look for something deeper, I would say. That because, you know, when, when your team is struggling with something, what's gonna motivate them is not how passionate they are about this framework or this language or technology in general. What's gonna motivate them when things are really tough, when times are tough, is some kind of higher purpose. And I don't mean like religious, I mean like serving people in some way. Um, Such yeah. as the CEO. <laughs> CEO. No. Not that kind of service. <laughs> yeah, so something um, like God, like CEO. Let's say that I'm a software developer, I'm not a team lead, I'm not in a position to like re-architect our interviewing process, but like I know we can do better. Mm. Uh, what can I do from like the bottom up? How can I like manage up to improve some of these like practices around hiring, interviewing, functioning as a team? Yeah, so your power is somewhat limited if you're in an environment that currently doesn't value hiring as much as it should and you are not in a position like with much leverage, then it's gonna be difficult. So you should consider whether or not it's worth your time and maybe you should just quit the company and go somewhere better. Um, but two, if you do wanna stay for whatever reason, uh, you don't wanna be a job hopper, which I am and I don't, I don't think it's a horrible thing. But um, if you do wanna stay at the company, then I think what you can do is you need to find somebody with that leverage. So you need to have conversations. You need to talk to the team lead, talk to the managers, try to find somebody high up in the organization. Most times if you're in an, an organization that does have some kind of hierarchy where there is a VP of engineering or CTO or whatever, they're usually pretty approachable. So even if you feel like you're like, you know, a lowly, you know, individual contributor, if you like ping somebody for lunch, like more often than not, they, you know, will, will take it, I find. And so tell them, you know, present the problem and then pre present some of the solutions you have, and then you're gonna be seen as a change maker, and it will probably you know, help you uh, advance through the ranks of the company as well. I always push people, uh, when, when, when you're trying to like, advocate, there's a perception that managers like to say no, and the reality is like managers love to say yes, yeah. and the more you can make it easy for them to say yes, the more likely the change you want is to happen, right? And so I think as that person, if you, if you get the lunch, you get the coffee conversation, and you say like, hey, I've been thinking about how we might, you know, I did this interview, and I felt like I was under a lot of pressure because I just gave a yes or no, and I wanted to break it down a little bit in more detail, and I took this rubric that I found from this place and customized it, and like, do you think we could have a rubric like this? And then they'll be like, yep, that's the rubric, done, let's go. And then also, it's like, oh, by the way now, this lady is the boss of hiring developers, and then you're like, no, it's not me, I don't know. Yeah, no, I've actually seen somebody who came in. She was actually a graduate of a boot camp, and she came, we hired her, and she did a, a Google Docs survey of everybody and, like, their impressions of interviewing. She presented the data to, like, the, you know, the VP, and she's like, look, here's some of the complaints people have about our interviewing process, and here are some of my suggestions for how we fix it. And now I she just heard from her, and she's being promoted to team lead. So, I mean, you know, these things, and this is, like, within, like, a year or something of being hired out of a boot camp. So um, I think they can, it's, it's definitely a good growth opportunity for you to start caring about these things. There's something, like, it's, uh, it's interesting, I think over the last, like, 10 years or so, we started to see more companies, uh, like HP, I think, was kind of an innovator in creating a career path that was very, like, code-centric, like, to stay as an individual contributor and not have to go into a management tier. But when I often get like asked the question, like, what's really the difference between a mid-level developer and a junior developer and a senior developer and so forth? What do you see as the difference? Like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my own thoughts for a minute. But like, how, if I, if I am like low in the hierarchy, how do I use this kind of like thinking about people to be a part of my like progression? Yeah, so I think, most of it is arbitrary. I think both the division between junior, mid-level, all that, I think it's very arbitrary and it varies from place to place and uh, it's not very meaningful to me. I think also this is a false dichotomy between the management track and uh, the technical track and it's something that I was ingrained in me when I first started my career and so anything that was like leadership at all, I was like, no, no, I'm gonna be a coder because I'm technical and I don't wanna fall into the management trap. And I'm just like, I'm kicking myself now because the thing is we're all leaders of our own life and we also have to 
participate and engage with people in, even as an individual contributor. So all of these skills, like emotional intelligence is often only taught to like leaders or people who want to become leaders. And I think that's silly because we're all humans who are all interacting in a human way. And so we all need to build leadership skills because if nothing else, we're leading our own life. And then we also may lead a project or even lead the implementation of a feature or lead a meeting or whatever it may be. And so I think those skills are, are useful um, across the board. I was thinking about it in the context of, of like one of the quotes Sarah had this morning uh, and talk over the years about like the 10x engineer and so forth. And if there's a 10x engineer, I think it's only because X is so low. Like there are some people in development jobs that don't belong there and like their productivity is so, so technically, yes, someone gets 10x more done than them. But even with experience, like your ability to write code, write features, do it correctly the first time, it seems like it turns up like gradually, but the only way that you can actually have this like really outsized impact to have that 10x, 100x, 1000x kind of impact is to cultivate like a team of people around you, whether you're like elbow to elbow as a contributor or you're the team lead or you're the department lead or whatever, it seems to be the only way we've figured out so far to like get more high quality work done fast. Yeah, yeah, I um, talked with a, a CTO of a startup in San Francisco and she said she doesn't look for 10X engineers, she wants to build a 10X team and that's kind of her goal. I wanna make uh, a little bit of time for questions from y'all. Um, what is like, if, if there's one like unconscious mistake that you see people making as you like go in and work with and talk with teams that just is like happening over and over. Uh, it's not not directly intentional, but you could do better. Yeah, so I think with hiring, the biggest thing would be kind of uh, assuming that your definition of what is smart is right. You know, a lot of times it's like, oh, we want to hire smart people, and you know, what does that mean? Are you really talking about their IQ? Because IQ tests are also biased, so that's not a good measurement. Are you talking about their performance on some specific like standardized test? Because those are those are also biased. It's been shown. So understanding that you don't know what smart is, and it's like something that you've constructed in your head based on your own biases. And so I think that's the biggest one is like recognizing that people from all kinds of backgrounds and with all kinds of experiences can be smart in that they can, can make contributions to the team. Good questions. The question is about um, when we're talking about emotional intelligence, like what if some of the emotional problems are not due to an individual but more to the culture of the company? And I would say that's why I find it useful to talk with leadership because they're in a position to change culture from the top too. So if it is a cultural issue, which it often is, uh, to be honest, um, then what I can teach to the individual is how to manage the situation that's happening. So like how to manage your emotions given the culture. And then what we always do at the end of my workshops is make a action plan for uh, how to improve the uh, as an individual and as the organization. So we actually do like a culture retrospective sometimes, depending, which means we talk about like, what are some ways, how would you describe culture, you know, at your company right now? How would you like it to be? What are we gonna do to get there? And so we really do approach it from an organizational level. And because leadership is usually present or at least, you know, engaged somehow, that's why we can actually make these changes because it's not just the individuals there. Yeah, so the question, I love the question. It's about vulnerability and the role of vulnerability in, um, in what we've been talking about. Especially like given that in the tech culture, I mean, ego is probably the biggest problem in tech, to be honest. Like I think every other problem resulting, like, you know, lack of diversity, uh, toxic cultures like Uber, all of that all stems from being driven by the ego. Not being willing to admit when we're wrong, not, uh, you know, looking deeper into like, you know, how we can improve ourselves, not admitting mistakes, not being vulnerable. So I think vulnerability is really important. And I, I think that teams with a healthy culture will value the fact that you're making yourself vulnerable. And so you may say, well, that doesn't sound like a lot of companies because <laughs> at every interview I've done, vulnerability has not been valued. And that's kind of the point. That's why I think like we, we need to have this full scale culture shift because most tech companies don't value vulnerability, don't value egoless programming, which they should. And so I, I think uh, when you have the privilege to be able to work where you want to, which a lot of engineers do get to that point, I would say select for the companies where you can be your authentic self fully. You can admit your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses, and you're still gonna be welcomed in because you're humble and that's valued on the team. And they appreciate the growth mindset, which is that whatever weakness you have, 
you can improve on it over time. Thanks, April. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.